Hi, I'm Bill Hodges, and this is Spotlight on Government. You know, we have some great people on this program, and people that are fun, people that are interesting, and people to be respected. And probably the man I have most respect for of all my guests that come on here is Dr. Earl Leonard, Supervisor of Elections for Hillsborough County. How great to have you back on the show in a different well, capacity. D different responsibility, different capacity, but it's, once again, it's great to be here and great to see that things are moving well for you. Well, you know, I don't believe there is anybody in Hillsborough government that knows more about Hillsborough County than you do. Well, that's be probably because I'm old and <laughs> I've been here a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great to be here, and, and it's certainly great to be back working and, and be a part of our governmental structure and, and our civic activities here in Hillsborough County once again. You started out as a school teacher here, correct? I did. I started teaching at Ruskin Elementary School, and, and I'll tell you the date. It was 1963, and it was a wonderful time and a wonderful area to start. It was just great. You must have graduated from high school about the same time I did, 1958 or so? Uh, 60, 60. 60. And then uh, I was very fortunate. You were really smart to get three <laughs> years and be back in a the classroom then. Well, I was very, very fortunate uh, in my life. But one of the fortunate areas was just as the time I was graduating from Brandon High School, the community leaders at that time, uh, Sam Gibbons, who was a member of the State House, and uh, later became a uh, congressman, and others, Ellsworth Simmons, who is also whose name is synonymous, synonymous with uh, government in Hillsborough County, and others were working to bring a university to this area. And I was very, very fortunate to be a member of the charter class of the University of South Florida. Really? And that was a great, great experience, and it's grown into a wonderfully great university as well. Could you ever have imagined that first tenuous day walking into a classroom with all those smiling faces oh. that one day there would be a huge mega high school name for you? Oh, absolutely. Would never would have thought, never could have dreamed anything like that would have would occur. In those days, the, the point was just to get an education, just to go to college, just to go to the university, uh, of course, was an overriding uh, issue for me. I was the and, first and, uh, one in my family. I don't know about you. Same here. First one in my family, and, and uh, uh, it was just great. The support we had. We, did, we didn't have the money, but we had a tremendous amount of support, and so uh, the community was good to me, uh, and, and of course, it took a lot of hard work, but we were able to, to make it, and things just worked well, and, and I felt very gra gra grateful to be a member of the charter class at the university. So I went through and, and took summer classes as well because I found something out. In those days, things were a little different than they are now, and you didn't pay by the hour. You paid by the semester. Semester. And if you took 12 hours, the, the uh, cost was $90 per semester. If you took 12 hours, it was $90. And if you took 15, it was 90 And if you took 18, it was 90 And if you took 21, it was 90 So I thought, well, you know, since the total number of credits for what equal graduation, that if I was going to get a deal, I could take more credits <laughs> for the same 90. And so it worked out. I was able to graduate in uh, uh, three years and, and then move on. Well, I, I worked my through. It took my through. I wasn't as bright as you, and it took me 10 years at well, the University of Dayton, serving in the United States Air Force and everything well, all at the same time. Well, that was awful important as well particularly, you know, during those particular times, as well as this today, is extremely important. Our armed forces is, is what makes this country, I, I think, secure in knowing that, that we are secure and that we are free. Yeah, I remember so, flying around the world on a sack bomber and looking out the window and seeing MiGs. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting time period. Absolutely. As is today, and the, the world in which we live today is also uh, extraordinarily interesting as well. Oh, these young men and women that are going back on their second and third tours, oh. I mean, these, these young people have my undying gratitude. And I think it's just one of my, one of my axes to grind. We've got to take care of those kids. Oh, absolutely. Make sure that every, when they question. come back, they've got a job and, and their health care. All that sort of good thing. All over the United States, we've, we, we've got to take care of our, of our military. We've got to take care of our people that are protecting us. You know, in Florida here, it was just yesterday's news, big news, 2,500 more of our National Guardsmen are, are being deployed. 
and uh, I think that we ought to do everything we possibly can here locally as well as statewide and, and uh, nationwide to support, to support their families. Their, absolutely. That's These just kids as are important. Leaving families right here. behind, and they're not all kids anymore. Well, you know, in my former my former life, we had a very close connection with MacDill Air Force Base. Uh, obviously, we had a, a school. We have Tinker Elementary, which is located on MacDill, and and we had a very close relationship with the base commander and the parents that had children in our schools, because you never knew what was going to happen. Uh, Nine eleven. You know, immediately our nation went into uh, a lockdown mode, and we had youngsters that were in our schools, and their parents were tied up with military obligations on the base. And you were superintendent so at that point. We had to deal with those issues, and, and those were extraordinarily important issues to deal with, and it, it was immediacy also, you know. Just out of curiosity, you went from that classroom teacher all the way through to being superintendent of what the tenth or eleventh largest school district in the world? Well, wound up being the eighth. Today it's eighth. the eighth largest, and, wow. and my hats off to Superintendent Elia and the job that she and her staff. What kind our, of budget were you dealing were with there? Well, we we grew into a, a billion plus budget uh, operation budget, and you know we had a, also a capital budget, uh, main, maintenance and and a new new construction and what have you, which was. Uh, varied from 150 million to 250 million per year in actual uh, building expenses. The interesting thing is, during the time uh, that I was superintendent, and that's not the reason we're here, but it was an interesting thing well, is that we built know, we I've, built uh, almost 60. Well, we built 60 schools during that period of time, and that's an interesting thing because we grew nearly 50,000 students. Uh, our our county was growing, our, our state growing, and, and today we're looking at a leveling off period, perhaps a cooling off period. But uh, I say to you that will we have winters like we're having today, uh, this year, <laughs> winters like we're experiencing, that we will, see, uh, we will see that growth continue. Hopefully it will not be quite that magnitude, but we will see growth continue in the state of Florida because it's a good place to live. You know, you just made, this is what we're here to talk about today, but that's what sets this show apart from things you're going to watch on Fox or MSN or one of those things. The purpose of this show really is to let people know in depth who's representing them, what their skills, what their backgrounds are, so that they have something besides 30-second time or uh, sound, bite. sound bites mm -hmm. to go by. And all of this now leads us to the superintendent of elections. Yes, supervisor of elections job, a different job, but it's similar in many ways. You know, it's, it's bringing the logistics of, of bringing equipment, uh, talent, personnel, training of the personnel, bringing it all together into, uh, into a, a one-time event and then making that event successful. So I it's, think it's, it's trust, very, too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that the people have to have trust in those that are serving them and those that are, are um, handling the equipment. And the trust has to, to go beyond that, that their, their vote is counted and is counted accurately and then is reported timely. And, and, and that's our goal in, the, in this office now. Well, uh, your, your predecessor was well on her way to revamping the office. Uh, Phyllis Busansky, actually the only interview that Phyllis did was on this program. And she talked about what her vision was for this office and to reinstitute the trust that was necessary to run a good voting system. And I can't help but think that if Phyllis isn't here, that she'd be smiling down and saying, we've got somebody that will carry it on. Well, I, I, I knew Phyllis and, and had a great deal of respect for her. Uh, I, I think the community at large in Hillsborough County and this central Florida area had a tremendous amount of respect for Phyllis's abilities, her attributes, what she believed in. And I know that one of the things she believed in is, is the democratic process, democracy, and, and allowing democracy to have its say. 
And uh, without question, she was well on the way of, of doing some things, I think, that brought uh, fiscal responsibility to the office. And we have continued along those lines. We've done some other uh, tweaking to ensure that the fiscal responsibility that is inherent in the office is there, that should be inherent in the office is there, and that the monies that our uh, taxpayers, our citizens spend, they get their value for those dollars. And while our goal is to ensure that the voting experience is a good one, that the vote is counted, counted accurately, and reported timely, we also want to do that in, in the uh, most economical way that we possibly can as well. And so that's, that's our Sounds mantra, that's our me. goal right now <laughs> is to ensure that that's done. And, and as I said, I've been very fortunate in, in, in my life that things have worked out. And I'll tell you, in looking at the 2010 election cycle, we, we're getting ex geared up and excited. But what has happened now recently, as you know, uh, Representative Mike Shanti has, has resigned his office in order to take a presidential appointment. Going up to and, the Pentagon. And as such, <coughs> as such, that has created a special election for, in the House District, our, our House of Representatives, 58. And the governor has set the time through the Secretary of State and the Division of Elections for us to, um, to have that special election. And so that... I think what, I, what I'm saying, this is like a, a, a great scrimmage before the big game because it allows us to, those of us that are new to this system, to, uh, to actually put on an election in a much smaller scale before the 2010 election, which is a much larger scale. You know, Hillsborough County is a pretty good-sized county. We're a large, a large uh, county. We have... Uh, in the last presidential election, 515,000 voters in 2008. And that's quite a bit. All at one time come together, 384 right. different polling sites or polling places uh, to come together all at one time and cast their ballot and then the sheer machinations that uh, occur to count those and then report the results is a tremendous logistical undertaking. And so this will give us a great opportunity to sharpen our tools and to sharpen our ability uh, because we'll be dealing with 49 precincts and about 60,000 voters in District 58. So this will be a, a great test for us. We're ready for it. We've got some great personnel. As Phyllis found out that when she uh, came into the office, just as I found out, that there are some people that have been at the supervisor's office for a number of years that are highly skilled professional elections personnel. Our election professionals uh, that have been operating the elections and, and know how to put on an election and know how to uh, follow the statutes, follow the federal regulations that are that are required, and move forward with conducting a good, flawless election. I like the fact that you didn't walk in there with a broom and start sweeping people out. Uh, <laughs> Cheryl Selvey, who is your I don't know whether it's an aide or a public information officer or however the title is, but she's just so easy to deal with. And I'm so delighted that you and she were able to come together and, and have her stay there. Oh, she's a great, great lady. She really is. And, and uh, I think the title is administrative assistant, but uh, in one day in a different <laughs> life, we would have called her a, a secretary, uh -huh. you know, a, a, a great, great uh, administrative assistant. She's, she's just uh, wonderful. She knows the system. She's been around Hillsborough County for a number of years. She knows the people. She knows the contacts. She's uh, one of those great gatekeepers that knows how to get but the gate know, open. But you know, I think the interesting thing is to match up with your personality of being a people person. She is also that kind of person. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and we and I kept our chief of staff, Craig Latimer. Craig has been in this business for a long time. He was with the sheriff's department for 35 years. He he uh, is absolutely concrete, sequential when it comes to dates and times in the past history that he's had employment history. We, we've also uh, have Chuck Smith that's been with the um, supervisor of elections office for over 30 years. He worked with. Uh, Pam Ioria, Robin Kravanek, all the way back into that, Pam did those a great years. Job. Yeah, absolutely. And so utilizing the talents, Tim Bridge, many of the candidates that are out there have worked with Tim Bridge over the years. And, and what I find my job is, 
is to bring those talents together. And get out of their way. <laughs> that's, that's the thing to do. Don't create issues that detract from their ability to do their job. And then I think once we do that, and then we start looking at how we can improve, how you can bring some new light into it, because every organization, no matter what, every organization has areas that we can improve and get some more uh, efficiency or efficacy of what of, of personal work things would you like to see in the future in the time that we as we move forward? Well, in the in the supervisor of elections office, I, I I would like for us to continue down the road so that we ensure that there is a level of trust and confidence in the people in this community that their vote, their sacred vote, is going to be counted, and it's going to be counted accurately and it's going to be reported in a timely manner. And I, I don't mean the first 15 minutes or the first uh, 30 minutes. Whatever but I, it but can I accurately I ab absolutely be reported. Mean that, <clears throat> mean that as soon as the canvassing board determines that this is in fact the results, we should be posting those as they come in for the folks that voted, number one, so they'll know where their candidate stands, but for the candidates as well. <laughs> That'd be an you know, awful Because day. they are certainly going to want to know. <laughs> I, I guess I, I really don't have thin enough, or thick enough skin to run because it'd be just so hard to sit there waiting to see whether people rejected you or accepted you. Well, rejection is hard to take, uh, it absolutely, but it's a, it's a, a point of life as well. Uh, a, a part of life. And you'll have to run again. The, the, you just get in here and you're going to have to run in 2010, right? Well, that's true. Uh, the, gov the gubernatorial appointment, uh, the governor of, by constitution in the state of Florida, is that you can appoint a constitutional office until the next general election. You know, these positions are filled by, by the people. By the people. That's what the election process is all about, our democracy. And for the governor to appoint someone uh, means that there's one person that thinks this person can do that job, and that's the governor. Obviously, Mora will go into it than just the governor's decision, but or the governor will have more input than just his decision uh, the, when he's in making his decision. But the people are the ones that should appoint our leaders. And as such, then, the governor's appointment is only until the next general election. And that next general election for us is going to be the election of 2010, where the primary is August 24. The general election will be November 2nd, 2010. And then that office, this office, then will serve for two years, which would be to put you back on the fill out Phyllis's <clears throat> term, and that will put us back on the constitutional officer's a schedule of every four years, which would be 2012 then uh, up again. But I also promised my wife, and, and as I said before, this is not going to be another one of those careers where there's 41 <laughs> years. You know, I spent 41 years in the school district and uh, loved every minute, actually, and, and, and every one of the jobs that I had I felt was um, the most important job there was at the time. There's no question. But I don't intend to uh, make this another career, but I do think the continuity of the office is important right now. I agree. Uh, in reestablishing and making sure that the confidence of our, our voters is there. And I rarely on this program go out on a limb and actually say, I, I think this guy is the guy to be there, but everything I've ever known about you and all the time that we've lived here now for 10 years has been totally positive. And well, I really think you are the guy that needs to be in that chair, and I was so delighted when the government did, governor did it because it wasn't a political appointment. I think that's, that's what thrilled me. You're not really a political guy. Yeah, I, I, tr I try to maintain that non-political stance because, you know, this is an office that is so important. It, it really should not be polarized into one area or the other. It is one in which we have to absolutely maintain a... a uh, equilibrium so that every candidate, every voter, whether, whether the voter is representative of a party affiliate or not. You know, we have a number of voters in Hillsborough County that do not have party affiliation. And every one of our voters must feel as though they have been treated fairly, they've been treated well, and every candidate 
regardless of party affiliation, non-party affiliation, they must feel as though that they have been handled. And this job is one in which what we need to do is ensure that everyone is treated fairly uh, and has had that opportunity for whatever, either to exercise their right to vote or to exercise their right as a candidate, to be a candidate. A couple of quick things. Will we maintain the same voting machines, or do I have to learn a new one? <laughs> At this time, uh, obviously, voting machines are going to have you are dictated not by the supervisor of elections, but by, by the state certification process. I thought and, each and the county state. could decide each, what they were going to do. Only, only within the limits of the certification program, which is conducted by the state. Okay. If the state certifies the machine, then you have the opportunity to do that. We in Hillsborough County are very fortunate because I'll tell you this, past administrations did uh, go out and purchase the machines. And the machines that we have purchased are good through the next, are certified uh, through the next election cycles, more than one, the 2010 and up to the 2012. And so as far as we know, unless some reason or another the legislature changes, which I absolutely don't see them doing because it's a pretty big expense and we just don't have the money to do that and there'd be no reason to, these will be the machines that we'll be using, which will once again be a paper ballot scanned in a, in a, uh, in a scanned format uh, and, and then calculated from that scanned format or tabulated from that scanned format. So it'll be a, uh, a paper ballot that you will fill out. Uh, voters will have a pen available to them, and they will then fill out the oval, very much like... Uh, we might have done on some of our tests, you know, the standardized tests that we've gotten used to in various aspects of our life. And they will fill in the oval, and then it will be scanned on an OSX, which is a voting machine scanner, and then that paper ballot will be deposited and saved in case we ever need to go back. And, and, and of course, there are audits that are done on, mm -hmm. on elections. And then uh, the tabulation will be done, of course, by the, uh, by the scanner. No hanging chads. No hanging chads. <laughs> no hanging, hanging chads. You know, one of the things that I liked about last year's election, or I shouldn't say, well, yeah, last year's election, presidential election, is they had multiple voting days. Yes. Can we expect to see that as a general trend? Yes, we can. Uh, uh, unless the legislature changes, as, as is the law right now, going into 2010, we will have early voting sites, and uh, you will be able to cast your vote at this point present time, the early voting sites are limited to the supervisor's offices, uh, either the main office or a branch, which for us is the 601 uh, East Kennedy, which is, of course, our county center, and the Falkenberg site, which is on North Falkenberg mm -hmm. uh, in Brandon. Those are the two places, plus we can also use the public libraries as uh, voting sites. And in the past 08 election, we used uh, uh, the voting si uh, libraries as voting sites as well, and our anticipation is to do the same. In fact, we're making those contacts and, and setting up the contracts and uh, right now in order to make sure that we have them in place for the uh, August 24th, 2010 primary election. We, of course, live in Sun City Center out there not far from Ruskin, where you were for so many years. Now you're in Riverview? Riverview, Alafire River. Yeah, on the river. Uh, and a lot of the people out there just can't go stand in lines. If there's a line, they, they have to pass. Well, you're right. You're I right. like the idea that they can go at a different time when it's not a long line to let those people have a chance to vote mm -hmm. without injuring their health or Exactly, exactly. Standing in line for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, some of our voters in, in, in a large population uh, that is getting larger, by the way, uh, really does, no longer have the physical stamina to do just that. You're right. And they shouldn't be called upon to do that. They shouldn't have to do that. We're working very hard to find ways that we can move the process along. Also, like give you an example. One of the ways I think we can speed things up is, is utilizing an electronic poll book. You know, we use the old register, which is very cumbersome in some respects. Mm -hmm. But now for early voting, we use uh, an electronic voting ID system, which is connected to the Florida voter registration system. 
and we can use that and access a, a voter and determine that the voter is in the right precinct mm -hmm. and is, is truly a, a, a qualified voter and then issue the ballot and make that process work much more quickly and efficiently, by the way, because we're removing a major portion of the human error and uh, do that through an electronic system. You know, we, well, and that's a, a part of our life now. And yeah. so we will be utilizing that system in the special uh, election in, in House uh, District 58. And we hope to be able to have electronic uh, registers at every precinct in the regular election, in the primary and general election in 2010. So this is something we're doing. Other things people can do, you know, is vote by mail. That's becoming more popular. I do, you know, for me, I, I prefer to go down and yeah. cast my ballot. There's something about sitting in my living room filling that out that just isn't as satisfying right. as going down and getting the I voted button. And well, you know, what? <coughs> I'm, I'm just like you. I like to go down to my precinct where I've been voting for so many years, and I like to be there. And, and you know, uh, actually, as long as I don't have to stand in line too long, <laughs> right. being able to stand there right. and talk, and, and talk with some of my friends <laughs> that I haven't right. seen in some time. And, and you know what? I'm finding out a lot of the statutes and, and regs, too, because it used to really interest me. I would get up to the table there with the register, and then they would say, your name? And I would say, you've known me for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> you gone blind. <laughs> and then, do you have identification? Right. Well, speaking of, you know, speaking of names and identification, <laughs> we've just run out of time. I've had Dr. Oh. Earl Leonard, Sub Hillsborough Superintendent of Elections, on the show with us. And I can't tell you, a man in Hillsborough County I have more respect for than this gentleman. I'm glad you're with us. You're unique. You're special. You're great. Tell yourself so often because you are, you know. And we'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government. Again, Dr. Leonard, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. struggle with me every time they read. Call now to help your child manage his learning disability. There's no reason to be held back. Excuse me. I'm in love. Hey, kid. My friend wants to know if that girl will go out with him. Pass it down. Hey, Grandma, ask the girl on the end if she wants to go out with this loner. The young man wants to know if the girl over there is a donor. Somebody wants to know if you're an organ and tissue donor. Yes. Hey, me too. <laughs> Are you a donor? Make sure your family knows your decision so there's no question later.